was just saying to, to the Deputy Prime Minister, for my, for my, for my personally, my eighth and final oh, event I'm right. of the CPS program. Um, so uh, saving the best for last. <laughs> is, uh, um, and thank you um, to you for coming. And thank you so much to Lloyds for supporting this event on a really, really interesting topic, which sort of speaks to so many of the challenges that we face as a country, which is um, the shock of the new, how can Britain adapt to a more unpredictable world? Um, and we're joined by a, a fantastic panel. Um, obviously, Olo Dowden is Deputy Prime Minister, but also heads the, uh, the Cabinet Office, which has responsibility for uh, national resilience and for, for coping, uh, coping with all, basically anything, if anything goes wrong, or it could go wrong, it's kind of ultimately comes back to the Cabinet Office. Um, and then uh, Bruce Carnegie Brown, who is Chairman of Lloyds of London, who are kindly supporting this, this event. Um, Baroness Morgan of Coates, who is the Chair of the Association of British Insurers, but will be better known to people, obviously, as, <laughs> as Nikki Morgan, uh, former Education Secretary, um, who, who has just reminded me we were on stage together at the Cheltenham Literary Festival in, uh, in a couple of in days. In some days, so hopefully see some of you there. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, Dee Dee Denham, who is Head of uh, AI, Quantum and Data Policy at Google, which I think is an issue which will probably come up. Um, so, um, I mean, the, the, Oliver, are you, are you, the, first, the first bullet points on this says, what shocks has the UK recently experienced? Which I think you, like, I, it doesn't really take a genius to answer. Yes, well, I, I think there's one word beginning with C and ending with, uh, with, with D that we, uh, we've spent quite a lot of time dealing with. But I mean, this, this might be a relatively small gathering, but uh, it is an incredibly important topic. And uh, if we didn't think it was an important topic before COVID hit, mm. We certainly know it's an important topic now, and that's why the Prime Minister has tasked me with leading our response, and we've created a new national security uh, committee structure with a national security resilience, uh, which I chair on his behalf to drive our efforts in this important area. So it's a really important area of debate. And um, I mean, did you have any... Um is, is there anything you'd like to get off your chest first? Or should, I, mean, I, I'm ha I shall, shall I say my, I'll, I'll say a few sort of opening yes. remarks yes. To, yes. To, to, to kick it off. So the, the, the first thing to say is that uh, this session might be described, I think it's somewhere up here, isn't it, as the, the shock of the new. Uh, but I think I see the job of government to ensure that the new isn't a shock. And that if I could distill yeah. it down into one sentence, it it would be that. That is to say that we have to be as ready as we possibly can to face the challenges and seize the opportunities that are coming down the track. And of course it's the case that when I look across the board, the world is more unstable and the risks that we face as a nation are increasing. Whether that's climate change with its direct consequences in terms of extreme weather or its indirect consequences in terms of migration patterns whether it's that geopolitical instability that, of course, we see with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, but across the board, we're seeing challenges to the rules-based international order. Or, and I'm sure we'll come on to this, is the rapid scale of technological uh, advances that we're seeing. And in particular, and I'll come on to this in a moment, what I genuinely believe will be a, a, a massive change in the history of humanity, which is the application of, of AI over the coming uh, decades. And of course, we began, and I'll end the first bit with, with uh, COVID. And through that particularly, we saw our vulnerability to biosecurity risks. So the essay question is the right one. Uh, how does Britain adapt to these uh, challenges? And have we learned the lessons by looking back? And of course, the COVID inquiry plays an important role in that. But more importantly, are we best prepared as we look forward to the challenges to come. And as you said, Robert, the, the Cabinet Office sits at the heart of our effort in response to this. We're the closest thing that government has to an HQ. It might be quite a dispersed organization, but we, we, we still have an HQ through Cabinet Office. And um, all of our work is, of course, in the shadow of, of COVID. And it is just worth reflecting a little on COVID, both in terms of how it tested uh, our resolve as a nation, but also our institutional architecture and our governmental structures. And it is worth bearing in mind that the impacts of COVID are going to be felt for decades to come, something I think we probably don't talk about enough, mm. not least in the impact on our children's education and on uh, mental health. So it's changed society 
for, for better and for worse, and we need to respond to that. As I said, the first effort is the Prime Minister charging me with leading our efforts to ensure that the government, the economy, and the whole of society is far more resilient in the, in the future. So in order to do that, we've overhauled the government's crisis response and preparedness structures, all outlined in the resilience framework we published earlier this year. And we are putting that framework into action. This isn't one of those documents where we produce it, we say, oh, well done, and it sits on the shelf. Nikki will know this from her time as minister. Occasionally that happens, but this is, this is not the case now. It is the, it's the spine and it's the driving force behind the efforts that we are undertaking in this area. So for example, we've split COBRA in two. This is one of the big lessons that we learned. Split it between the immediate crisis response and the long-term resilience, because otherwise the risk is COBRA spends all its time focused on the day-to-day -day crisis, doesn't think about the long-term. Uh, so out of COBRA, we've carved the resilience directorate who are looking forward to those emerging risks and embedding a deeper culture of resilience right across government. And that is headed by Mary Jones, who's a, a brilliant civil servant uh, leading that area. Uh, we've also formed the dedicated NSCR, so that's the Resilience National Security Committee, which I chair. I also, though, chair the UK Resilience Forum. And this is another important innovation that reflects our whole of society approach. And it's a great uh, innovation bringing together voluntary uh, community sector, emergency, responder, emergency responders, business groups, and government to look at these challenges. Uh, in addition to that, we are creating a resilience academy that's being carved out of the emergency planning college. That's about skilling up the people for crisis management and, uh, and institutional resilience. And I detect huge appetite and demand to, uh, to do this. Uh, as I said, this isn't uh, the traditional document sits on the shelf. It's also not the traditional make one announcement and, and stop. It's a genuinely dynamic and iterative process. And events like this and the kind of conversations I've had uh, with you at, at Lloyd's and many other partners helps inform that. And that's why the resilience framework sets out an architecture to, to 2030 to make sure we're match fit uh, for those challenges. But it does require collective effort um, and collaboration between government, local resilience fora, civil society, businesses, and individuals. But the, the golden thread running through all of this is how we coordinate those efforts and we bring them together. And of course, we expect crises to test us, uh, and everyone brings something unexpected. But the tests of crisis should be, have we learned the lessons of what's gone before, and we, are we better prepared for what is to come? And on that basis, uh, I believe we have made a lot of progress, but I believe there's a lot more for us to do, and it's something that seizes me. I'm working with ministers through the um, NSCR structure, seizes the whole of government. It is a, uh, an increasing risk picture, and that was reflected in the National Risk Register mm. we published this summer, and I took the active decision on that to be as transparent as we possibly can be. We put much more information out about the risks that are facing government. And perhaps if I can conclude on the, the uh, risk du jour, as it were, which is uh, artificial I intelligence. I genuinely believe that this is the biggest emerging public policy challenge that we face. Uh, of course, this session is going to be focused on resilience, and it's right we do that. I should say at the beginning, <laughs> I'm very optimistic about the opportunities of AI if we get this right, but, but my job essentially in government, working with the decent Secretary of State, is to focus on those risks. It's something that I spoke about at the UN General Assembly where I delivered the UK's keynote address on behalf of the Prime Minister a couple of weeks ago. And as I said there, it, it does have the power to unlock science innovation that was unimaginable just a year ago uh, and bring forward solutions to some of the most intractable challenges facing society, whether that's uh, in relation to nuclear technology, climate change, energy security. But equally, we have to be clear-eyed about these risks. And it really would be negligent of policy uh, makers to ignore the warnings and that one warning in particular that many of you would have seen and certainly it's the first time in my lifetime I've known of uh, a group of regulated uh, companies and individuals to say to government 
the regulator regulate us more mm. and to warn of an existential threat to humanity. Now, that is not something that is said lightly, and so, uh, of course, we need to look at that, that risk. Now, I'm, we're managing lots of risks in relation to AI, many of which, in fact, the overwhelming majority, don't have the, the, the potential to tip over into existential uh, threats, but none, nonetheless, we do have to focus on the, the frontier AI risk spectrum, and that's where uh, the, these warnings come in relation to misuse, misadventure, and misalignment. And that's really where our focus is on those frontier risks. And just to talk about those very briefly, so when I say misuse, what I mean is that AI lowers the barrier to, barrier to entry for malign actors to carry out cyber attacks and to intuit how to cause harm. So that's the, mis, the misuse part. Misadventure is we simply don't know what some of these models might be capable of and the unintended consequences of frontier expansion. So we have to uh, examine the misadventure and misalignment. Mm -hmm. That's the point about ensuring, because we can't guarantee that models will be aligned with human objectives and will respond to prompts in predictable ways. And then beyond all of that, there's also valid concerns about bias, data privacy, a hallucination whereby essentially AI makes stuff up, uh, and deep fakes. Um, but the good news, after all that sort of negative burst, is yes. a Gordon Brown style news sandwich, <laughs> is that um, the UK really has been at the frontier of efforts to respond to this. And what I think we've done uniquely in the UK is through the AI task force is to bring together the very best of frontier AI companies that are reflected uniquely uh, in the UK, outside of the US. UK and the US, we have the, that, that uh, presence. But also, crucially, experts, academics, and national security officials. And I've never known a time when we've had both these frontier AI companies, Emergent Tech and the director of GCHQ, and my, the deputy national security advisor who sits in the, the cabinet office. So it's looking at those, uh, those risks and how we respond to them with all, all the knowledge required. And what I hope is that through the Bletchley Park Summit, that will then uh, help to build off the back of that some kind of multilateral international consensus. Now, we're not going to achieve it overnight, but if we can start, uh, unsurprisingly, but if we can start to make some progress in that area, I certainly detected in New York and Washington, where I was recently in my interactions with many ministers around the world, there is an appetite for us to work together on this. So briefly, in, in conclusion, uh, uh, I think that all innovation change comes with inherent unpredictability. Uh, and the faster that change, the more difficult it becomes to make predictions. And the thing about AI is it's heralding change at an hitherto unimaginable a pace. What we can't do is what's happened in the past, which is the legacy regulation model, whereby the, the change happens and then we catch up subsequently with the regulation. And Nick and I both experienced this with the regulation of social media, yeah, yeah. which essentially came 20 years after it was Absolutely. invented and 10 years after the harms became yeah. very uh, apparent. We have to make sure that this happens in parallel and it happens on a multilateral basis. We have to draw all AI nations and countries around the world together to make that happen. So it's going to be a, a marathon, not a sprint, but the challenge is to make sure that our regulation moves with the technological developments and we bring to people together uh, with us. I'm actually fundamentally optimistic. I think the, the experience of the UK government uh, and uh, eventually governments around the world is that we see challenges and we address them. We, we've done so in relation to the architecture we put around nuclear, for example, and biological. The difference here, though, and the thing that worries me about it and the need for urgency is quite the, the speed of this change and the scale of the consequences of it. Uh, but I think we can rise to that challenge, and I'm confident we will. So thank you for joining this discussion. Mm. So, the, so the message I'm getting is, the world may be destroyed, but don't worry, the British government is on the case. <laughs> <laughs> Which should reassure us all. Um, Bruce, your, your thoughts? Well, I, I think um, all of us touched on a huge number of the, of the issues. But uh, if I look at the first quarter of the 21st century, it's bookended by uh, a terrorist attack on the Twin Towers in New York, uh, and at the back end, uh, by a land war in Europe, uh, and in the middle, 
uh, we have a, a pandemic and a global financial crisis. And it would be um, a surprising individual who would conclude that the next three quarters of the 21st century won't throw up uh, similar levels of risk for all of us. Uh, and in that first quarter, we haven't yet had the impact of climate change, the impact of cyber, the potential consequences of, of AI. And so uh, this need to be prepared to, to think about these issues um, has, has never been greater. Um, and, and I think the other piece of this is to talk, uh, if, I, if I talk my book in terms of insurance, um, in, insurance is typically, um, works when, when uh, risks are defined by time and place. So uh, a hurricane blows through uh, Florida for a particular uh, point in time and causes a certain amount of damage, but ultimately uh, it, it is um, embraceable uh, either in terms of time or, or place. When you look at risks uh, like cyber, risks like pandemic, risks like climate change, these are potentially everywhere all at the same time. Uh, and these become very hard risks to ensure which is why the private sector needs to have good partnership with the public sector. Yeah. I think the other piece of this is that uh, actually through a process of these kinds of uh, risks, uh, democratic governments have ended up owning the risk. Uh, our citizens expect us to bail, uh, yeah. expect them to, to be bailed out by government. It happened in the pandemic with furlough schemes and other things, it immediately moved to the energy crisis. Uh, even people started asking for help with their mortgage payments uh, because interest rates had risen. When of course the whole purpose of mortgage rates rising was to squeeze the economy and if the government was then gonna put a lot of money in to help uh, citizens with their uh, mortgage rates, that wasn't gonna help bring I inflation down. So, so this issue of what is the responsibility of government and what can we expect uh, citizens to do to respond is, in my view, really important. Um, and I, I sort of liken the development, for instance, of cyber risk uh, to uh, having a homeowner's policy. Uh, what we all know now, if we want to have insurance for our homes, we have to have window locks and we have to have burglar alarms, and that makes the insurance available and affordable. And increasingly, what the insurance industry is doing in underwriting cyber risk is requiring the counterparties, and these, of course, are mostly businesses rather than individuals, uh, is to look at their mitigation strategies. Um, and a big part of what the insurance industry is doing is trying to raise awareness of these risks so that people then mitigate them uh, before then uh, insurance comes into play in terms of putting people back on their feet when a disaster has struck. And in, in that respect, we're very aligned with government in trying to raise awareness uh, around this. Um, cyber risk is the fastest growing line of business we have at Lloyd's of London. Uh, the total market today is worth about $10 billion in premiums paid annually, 25% uh, of that number is underwritten at Lloyd's, so we have a very big stake in the cyber risk uh, industry, and of course in getting those risk choices right. And most predictions are that those premiums will double uh, in the next three or four years, uh, which will reflect the increase uh, in the risk. And interestingly, 85% of all cyber risk insurance we provide at Lloyd's is provided to US corporations. So the awareness is much greater over there than it yet is in this country or uh, in Europe or across the rest of the world. So, so there's a job of, uh, to do to raise awareness uh, and then of course to try to get people to take uh, the necessary steps to try to mitigate the risks, which is all part of building resilience uh, into the economy against these kinds of threats. Well, thank you very much. As you say, uh, Robert, I'm here with sort of, well, I'm, I'm here with one hat on, according to the uh, uh, presentation, but I'm obviously here as a, a conservative member uh, and supporter as well. And it seems to me, from everything we've heard so far, we're talking in a way about the Rumsfeld um, known unknowns and unknown yeah, unknowns, exactly. basically. And it's easy to talk about the things that we, um, we anticipate or the things we anticipate now because of what's happened. But I bet if you'd asked a number of businesses, um, large and small, a few years ago, whether a pandemic was on their risk register, the answer would have been no. Perhaps it should have been, um, but the fact is that we will probably now never approve risk registers anymore that don't have a pandemic listed on them. Bruce has already talked about the, the threat from cyber, and I suspect we'll have various questions about all these other types of risks. Um, and obviously, I'm here uh, with my ABI hat on, so insurance has to play a part, and I'm sure that will come up in the, uh, in the discussions. I suppose just in the time available, I really want to land a couple of points. Um, I think uh, one of the key questions that you've asked here uh, is how can the government work with the private sector? And I think that is absolutely important. 
And I think those conversations between government and uh, private sector, particularly obviously the insurers, um, is of fundamental importance in giving people the confidence to know that actually should some of these terrible events, these unknown unknowns happen, that they are protected. But that does mean real open dialogue. And what that also means is that in some cases, government does need to step up and say, we will underwrite some of the risk in order for the sector then to be able to write that insurance uh, as well. And that's a very live issue in a number of things. Um, uh, Floodry, Poolry um, uh, are, are two good examples of that, but there are going to be others, I think, as these um, uh, big uh, systemic risks uh, take, take shape. The other thing, and I'm really pleased we're going to talk about AI, I'm going to leave that to, to Dini, but I think the, uh, the government's work on the AI summit is really, really important and very, very welcome. And I think out of that will come more around cyber risks uh, and what the sector needs to do. The other thing, of course, is the other, the other role the investment sector uh, can play is investment in preventative infrastructure. Um, I remember um, I had just uh, handed over the culture role to Oliver, um, and then the pandemic really uh, took off. Um, uh, both was I glad that I was not fronting up the press conferences as, as he was, uh, but also I remember being really quite concerned about whether our digital infrastructure in the UK was going to hold up to the sudden mass working from home, uh, from uh, all of us needing to be much more reliant on digital. Actually, it did, uh, by and large, and I think that's thanks to the enormous investment in digital infrastructure by the private sector, um, as well as, obviously, arms of government that had happened in the previous years. But I think in terms of thinking about these risks and how we manage them, it's also about what can we think about investing in good preventative infrastructure so that when the risks happen, when the, the events happen, we are prepared. That also means changing the narrative, which is um, about the conversation, the scrutiny, which is, I always think back to the pandemic, and I think the inevitable question that would have been asked is, why do you have a stockpile of PPE that you think is not going to be used? I'd like to think no one would now ask that question. I think that question would still be asked now. Why have you got all this stuff sitting in a warehouse? Well, we know why we might need it. And actually, government's role, supported by the private sector, is to help to make that prevention and preparation uh, uh, moves uh, ready. Um, and so I think we have to be much less squeamish now about spending money to prevent these risks, or at least to help to mitigate them when they do materialize. And did you now uh, on the AI front? Yes, yeah, well, um, so, Obviously, you know, in recent months, the advances in generative AI have really kind of captured the uh, public's imagination and chatbots like BARD or ChatGPT have enabled people to interact and use AI in completely new ways. But you know, the reality is a lot of us have been using AI for many years. If you've ever used Google Search, Maps, Translate, all powered by AI. Um, and I think if we think about how far we've come, you know, technologically in just 25 years, we have a stat that in 1997, just 7% of the UK population had access to the internet uh, in their homes, and it was at speeds that were 2,000 times slower than they are today. So if you think about how far you know, the, this kind of uh, first quarter of, of this century has come, it's been incredible. But there's no doubt that this uh, growth in AI is you know, a, a really significant technological shift, um, and it's changing the way we can engage with information and also how we can manage risks. So we have flood forecasting that now um, is available in 80 countries and allows you to predict with really great accuracy kind of up to seven days in advance whether an area is likely to flood. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that can be really beneficial in managing um, this risk. And there is, I think, broad consensus, and I've, I've heard, you know, pockets of um, optimism on the panel so far, that there is really significant opportunity for for the world, for the UK particular, particularly, but you know, this, these advances do give rise to legitimate concerns about kind of novel and serious risks that I think we need to address. Um, and whether it's you know, the rise of radio or the creation of the internet, we've always, you know, they've introduced needs for kind of new legal frameworks and, and social norms, and we've had to develop those yeah. together, and I think AI is no different. You know, it will take uh, the metaphorical village to do that, and um, so industry working with yeah with government um, and civil society and academia. But I, you know, I think we, we do need to remember the opportunity. Um, and Public First conducted some research that said that uh, AI could present a 400 billion uh, pound opportunity to the UK economy by 2030. And that's really significant. Can save, they believe, you know, kind of generative AI could save the average worker 100 hours a year. 
uh, doctors and teachers 700,000 hours a year in uh, administrative tasks. So if you think about how, if, you know, we do take advantage of that, that can have a really significant opportunity, but we do need to work together on it. We've got some ideas about how we can do that, how we can work with government um, creation of a national skills service that would offer and accreditate, you know, lifelong learning modules so that people are well equipped and there's that societal resilience um, for, for the change in, in technology also establishing a, a UK research cloud, which could provide access uh, to compute capacity uh, for academia and researchers, and I think that compute question is really important uh, when it comes to resilience too. Um, and then finally, you know, regulation, and, and the Deputy Prime Minister touched on this, and we have long called for regulation of AI. Of AI um, and I think the UK's approach is, you know, a really positive one and actually is flexible, proportionate, uh, rooted in the, or focused in the kind of context in which AI is deployed, um, and rooted in those kind of clear and fair principles. Um, importantly, we'll build upon regulation that already applies to this technology, and we've seen, you know, a number of the regulators already, with responsibility for digital regulation, the ICO, the CMA, already starting to take action in this, which I think is, is really important. So, um, we remain kind of optimistic, but uh, to, to take a phrase clear-eyed about some of the challenges and, and how we should address those. F fantastic. I mean, it, it feels like this discussion is slightly polarizing into AI and everything else. Yeah. And, and in, fact, in fact, my first, first question kind of, kind of reflects that, um, in that, because uh, this doesn't apply so much to AI, but one of the sort of, another phrase for resilience is, 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 is margin or cushion or having, I mean, one of the things that was sort of became clear when the pandemic arose, which is that we'd, we'd, we'd been running the NHS too hot and too close, you know, in terms of capacity, for, for, you know, we'd always, um, you, know, uh, you know, it had been, you know, so there wasn't as much margin to cope when something else was happened. I mean, Nick, Nikki's talking about sort of stock, stockpiles and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, uh, but the problem is that all of that stuff is quite expensive. Um, if you're building in margin, you are, you are increasing cost. And if you're a government, that means you're ultimately increasing spending, which means increasing taxes, unless uh, growth happens. But obviously, in a deeply uncertain, in a more uncertain world in which things can be knocked off course, growth is, is harder to come by. So, I mean, how do you square that circle of, you know, that, that resilience, basically resilience costs, costs money, but an uncertain world makes it harder for there to be uh, money? Well, I, I think it's an, an excellent question. It goes to the nub of an awful lot of what I have to deal with through the, the National Security Committee on uh, Resilience. I just make t two observations. The first is we have to overcome a, a natural human um, disposition, which is uh, something immediately before you. It commands much more attention yeah. than the risk of something that may ha happen in the future, even if you take the chance of the risk and times it by the impact, and you get a much larger Yes. I impact than the the, uh, the, the the current a few years position. ago I, I, I ghost wrote an article for um, I think the, uh, for uh, the launch of the um, coalition on epidemic preparedness in which they they argued hey there's there might be this thing called a pandemic and you know <laughs> historically they've taken quite a lot of money quite a lot off of GDP and everyone's like yeah whatever yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. so so there's that thing and then the other thing which you've absolutely hit the nail on the head is we can the government cannot prepare for and mitigate against every risk if you take the publicly Pub, the published national risk register, and it's 100 risks. If I was to make sure that the government was fully prepared against all of those 100 risks, I'd probably take up the, the entire UK economy a couple of times over. Uh, you have to make judgments, and those judgments are about trying to get the greatest, the, the most accurate analysis of probability and the most accurate analysis of impact. Yeah. And the, the metric we use, and you, you can see it in our public documents, you, you put, uh, I can't remember whether it's X or Y axis, but you put uh, impact up the Y axis and uh, likelihood along the X axis, and you, you focus on your, your top right-hand corner, so high likelihood, uh, high impact. And it is still the case that some kind of biological uh, hazard, most likely a pandemic flu, although we saw with COVID it doesn't necessarily have to take the form of a, a pandemic flu, is the, the most likely and the most high impact uh, combined, and whether it's, whether it's a more likely, but the impact is, is, is much less. So that's how we try and uh, we conduct our, our analysis and approach. The, the, 
further challenge, though, is the world is moving so uh, rapidly, and particularly with geopolitical instability. Let's park aside uh, AI for one second. Mm how you mitigate against those risks. So for example, if there was conflict in the South China Sea and the impact on, um, mm -hmm. on global chips market uh, of, on the, uh, in terms of the impact on Taiwan. That's another thing where uh, it's not just simple sort of um, actuarial uh, calculations. There's a further geopolitical judgment which further complicates the, the, the analysis. And government is grappling with all of those things. And what I seek to do on the Prime Minister's behalf working with my excellent team at the NSS is, is to try and grapple and prioritise those risks and allocate uh, resources in a proportionate and appropriate way. But, but, yeah. but the other thing, I mean, so I think you, it's a really good question about uh, spending. I mean, that's the, you know, a big debate at this whole conference, hasn't it, about public spending and the impact on um, uh, taxation levels and others. Two things, I suppose. One is, the question is, and all of us, obviously, you ha everyone has to prioritise, whether you're talking about, you know, individuals, tiny little businesses, governments, what, what are the priorities? But where else could the extra capacity either, if it's not existing, where can it be created? So what we did see in the pandemic was a number of manufacturing businesses who were able to refocus what they did very quickly and start to provide PPE. Well, actually, is that in something that we are, we are thinking about? The other thing is, and we are conservatives, which is actually the role of government and private sector. So there'll be things that actually it's not right for the taxpayer or the public sector to be asked to fund, but this is where the insurance sector or other sectors are able to step in to provide some of that mitigation. And so actually those conversations that, that are happening, um, and they, let's be honest, they happen more successfully in you know, some parts of government than, than others. There's more of a willingness to understand what the private sector can do to take some of the burden off the, the public sector. What we're better, what we're more skilled at in terms of assessing risk. And I think we just need to see more and more of that. And as I just echo what, what Nikki said, I think the, the biggest single takeout from COVID and our response is that whole of society exactly. approach, not government owning it itself, but working uh, with, with all parts of society. Yes, although if, if Taiwan's chip fabs get taken out, <laughs> I'm not sure there's how much that the whole of society can... Well, interestingly... Well, if you think about the, the, the yeah. Welsh, the Welsh um, you know, chip uh, company, uh, you know, actually, w w where do we have the capacity? Where have we got? I mean, one of the bigger the debates is, you know, which companies are we allowing to be, to be bought? W what could we do to try and put some of that right to plan in advance? And also, on the, the whole of society, I suppose, it is the case that the, it's not government that is going... Well, government will feel the impact of it, but businesses and yeah. the health service and every part of society Absolutely. will will feel the impact of that, so it will have consequence for them, so the response has to be whole society. Uh, Bruce, I mean, I, I, if you have thoughts on this, or if you dare to tell us what Lloyds think the most, the catastrophic things that could happen to this country are, is there a kind of, sort of, like, num number of trillions of pounds cost of various? Well, we do run areas. what we call realistic disaster scenarios, um, and we try to position them in different industries and different continents to try to understand uh, the impacts, we've done uh, an assessment, for instance, of a cyber attack on the uh, electricity grid in North America, uh, bringing down power stations and, and starving businesses and people of uh, electricity. Uh, we just recently completed a similar example around um, a geopolitical issue in Taiwan uh, and, the, and the impact on supply chains um, uh, uh, from that. And, and these things uh, escalate to frightening numbers very, very quickly. Um, and I think to the point that made by panelists already, um, part, part of the challenge, and you know, we're at a Conservative Party conference and all of us implicitly and explicitly believe in, in capitalism, but capital, capitalist business models have for many, many decades rewarded uh, high top line growth and high bottom line uh, growth uh, at just in time industries, uh, uh, just in time inventories, extended supply chains, um, and uh, the resilience of our businesses, I think, is, in, and, and then we pile a whole bunch of debt on the balance sheet as well to gear up the returns. Uh, and, and so our businesses are actually, I think, financially less resilient than they were um, many, many years ago. And that's probably truer in the, in the uh, manufacturing sector than it is in the banking sector that has been very heavily regulated around capital and liquidity for, for the best part of 20 years. Um, but we need to think about what, what we should be applying in our valuation of businesses around the issue of resilience. Um, and while companies report risk registers in their annual report, uh, these aren't very fully explored in terms of what would happen if yeah. uh, a, a kinds of analysis. Um, and COVID, I we think, are, was quite a good lesson. We are heavily dependent on our techno king, Elon Musk, is my, my favorite line in the risk <laughs> register. <laughs> 
Well, well, there you go, exactly. Um, so so uh, somehow we think we'll be able to move the risks somewhere else from, from where we are. And when these risks are everywhere at the same time, that becomes really hard to do. Um, so uh, we'll open the questions, but uh, one more question uh, to bring Diddy back into this. I mean, you talked about the need to reg regulate more quickly and for government to, to keep up, but I mean, is it, is, is it not based essentially impossible to imagine government moving at the same speed of AI? I mean, we've reached a stage where the online safety bill, ghastly thing the way it is, you might disagree, um, <laughs> has, been lumbering, has been lumbering through the system for so long, it's now being sold as really the first AI bill, because it, it's like it's been sort of lapped by, by events. <laughs> I mean, how, how can government actually keep up? And you know, the, 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 the growth between GPTs two, three, four, it, five it, yeah. is, is extraordinary. Oliver, you go first, <laughs> and I'll, I'll collect my thoughts. And, uh, well, I, I think it's a really good question and really important, but I think that's actually one of the benefits of the UK's approach um, in that it's empowering the regulators to use their existing expertise and issue guidance. And you know, they haven't waited for that. And actually, the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, uh, the DRCF, which brings together the four uh, key digital regulators, has said that actually in a lot of cases they are already empowered to issue guidance and take action in areas on generative AI. So I think we also need to realize we're not stop or starting from zero. You know, there is existing the GDPR, privacy legislation, upcoming content regulation, you know, will all apply to AI as well. Um, and so I think that kind of flexibility is allowing them to act more quickly. But I think also it can't just be up to governance I or governments. I think we need kind of a multi-layered approach to this. Um, so we also need industry engagement and we've seen that come together quite rapidly really uh, in the last few months. The Frontier Model Forum brings together the leading AI labs. Um, we have signed up to voluntary commitments on AI with the White House. Um, and then we also, obviously, kind of a national level, we need action, which we've seen from the UK. And then we also need that kind of international alignment too, because it's such a cross-cutting technology. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we've seen, you know, relatively rapid progress there. Um, not least the UK's uh, Frontier AI Summit, um, which is really leading the way. We've seen initiatives from the G7, the OECD, the UN. So I think, you know, I I'm positive about the, the, the uh, capability to keep up, but I think it's up to everyone to kind of be involved. Well, I'd certainly echo what, what these, I'll uh, just make a couple more observations, which is one, uh, AI is, uh, and even more so, become totally ubiquitous. So uh, AI, a lot of AI will just fall into the existing regulatory framework. So the application of AI when you land your, when your plane, plane lands and determines the gate, that's gonna fit within CAA frameworks mm -hmm. and so on. So a lot of this is, uh, all, all of society just having a, a sort of step change in capabilities. The, there are areas, though, that, uh, that re require a more bespoke approach. Uh, I share your optimism about the speed of, of action. It's not just the UK. As you mm -hmm. said, a couple of, even 18 months ago, there was no action in this area at all. Now we've got uh, Biden's voluntary um, uh, accords, which mm -hmm. have got, are already being in, entrenched. We've got the G7 Hiroshima process in the UK is focusing on, uh, on, on frontier a AI through the, the AI task force. And by the way, it's the first time I've ever seen at such speed as getting together the, the finest uh, minds from uh, industry and from the government and national security mm -hmm. side of things. So the, there's a cause for optimism there. The final reflection is when big things happen, government has to act fast yeah. and does act fast. And this this is going to be big, and it's going to force government to, to, to move at pace. And whatever the, I mean, social media was a, uh, a big societal shift, particularly in the, the, the political arena, but I think you can add a couple of zeros to the, the impact that a, AI will have, and it's simply, we cannot repeat the, 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 the lag approach. Fair enough. Um, we can, uh, uh, the gents with the microphone, can, uh, if anyone has any, has any questions, otherwise I can, I can just ramble. So. Uh, the gentleman at the front. Thank you. Uh, question for the Deputy Prime Minister. I'm picking up your point about the whole of society response. In particular, you mentioned the conscious decision you made to make the process around the National Risk Register transparent. Um, we obviously welcome that. Sorry, I should say Cameron Murray of Lloyds of London. Um, we, we welcome that and having been engaging extensively with, with Mary 
resilience director and her team. I'm just curious, have you had um, a response from beyond the insurance sector? I mean, has, it, has, that, has that decision borne fruit? Uh, yeah, yes is the short answer. So I think that COVID was a wake-up call and it's meant that something like this, which may have been a bit of a backwater, is much more at, at, at the front of companies and voluntary organisations and minds. But, but moreover, the way we've sought to structure it, particularly through the, uh, the, the, the forum that uh, we've created, I'm actively bringing in stakeholders, as it were, to use that, that awful phrase, uh, but who in turn are engaging with their communities and disseminating these, uh, uh, these risks. But I think, as you said, Robert, and, and others have said, there remains a big gap between uh, a risk function in a, a corporate or a, a voluntary organisation, the risk function then taking on board the government's assessment in the National Risk Register, which I think is happening more, then identifying the risk, but then actually doing something uh, about it and doing something proportionate about it. And clearly there is a lot more work to be done in, 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 in that space. And anyone else want to come in? Well, I, I'd say I think uh, the, the challenge here is that regulation typically lags, lags the risk, and we've all, all, all agreed about that. But I think there are mechanisms out there that can push responsibility to people who are very close to these risks very quickly. So what we know about things like um, uh, use of cyber or use of um, uh, AIs, they can be enormously beneficial to society, but also potentially very damaging. And I think that if you look at... Um, regulation of the financial services industry, for instance, in this country. It's outcomes-based uh, in terms of, of, of where the focus uh, is. And then through things like the senior manager regime or uh, GDPR, has been mentioned, uh, there are very stiff penalties for getting this, this, this wrong. And so on the one hand, we want to encourage the development of AI in a responsible way because it will be transformative in very positive ways for many, uh, in fact, all of our lives, uh, but also carries these risks. And so you, you want to know is that the people at the front end are making conscious choices about whether their participation in the development of this industry is benign or malign. Uh, and what you want them to feel is that if it is malign, uh, the, 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 the power of the law will, will get them. Now, all of that may be after the event in terms of the risks that are created, but, but putting the onus of responsibility onto the individuals uh, and the companies that are going to be responsible for developing these things, uh, I think already exists in a lot of our regulatory uh, structures, and it may need to be broadened or focused more uh, over time. What I don't think we need is a whole new regulatory environment for this. But I think this is this one thing, Oliver, you mentioned, but it's worth drawing out. Um, so far, the cornerstone of the UK's approach does seem to be to not to create an AI super regulator, but to just mm. accept that AI is, is, ev is going to be everywhere and everything, and that every regulator needs to have AI as, you know, have, an, have a watching brief. Is that, that, that's correct, subject to the very large caveat, which is about uh, understanding the impact of frontier AI, yeah. particularly apart, as we apart, go yes, apart from along the, the path uh, to, to artificial, uh, <laughs> to, 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 um, uh, uh, to agentic AI. And uh, agentic AI is the, the thing that has the potential to have huge, huge consequences. And there's certain risks and parameters uh, around it that we need to identify and are identifying along the path towards agentic AI. Mm. Uh, yeah, and I think just to add on the kind of general AI, it's it's important that every regulator has this expertise because it is going to impact, you know, it's cross-cutting, it will impact every industry. Um, and so it's important that they kind of develop that technical expertise. And I think the UK's uh, approach also has a kind of central hub, which will have technical expertise that regulators can call on as well. And I think that is important. And it's, you know, important that regulators are kind of given the capacity and funding to kind of keep up with the rate of technological change too. Um, and I think just one more thing I'd, I'd mention is um, in the US we've seen that NIST have developed a um, AI risk management framework which aligns around kind of common language and understanding of how uh, we should identify and manage risks. And I think it would be helpful to have something similar in the UK too, just to make sure we're all coming at it from the same place. Any further questions? God, this is your, own, your only chance. Otherwise, I'm going to have to ask another question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, obviously, companies like Google pay lots of money to lots of very, very clever engineers in the AI, AI space and that kind of thing. And typically, the government, for example, doesn't pay 
digital experts quite the same amount of money. So I guess my question is, how can the government prepare for these kind of risks uh, and attract the kind of quality of, of staff and the level of expertise that they need to kind of be, be in a position to kind of really understand how things are changing? Yes, I mean, there, there, there was a meme that goes around every so often, you know, as we you know, head of, head of national cyber, you know, security at MI5, you know, 30 grand, or, you know, or, or whatever it may be, like all these, these job adverts for incredibly important jobs, which seem to have uh, extremely low salaries. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think it was MI5, but no, yeah, no, I, I, I saw that one, and actually off the back of it, I've, we, are, we have removed the cap on, on salaries in this area, but it's a very important challenge that you uh, raise, and actually, funnily enough, you mentioned the agencies, I'm, I'm, I'm relatively com confident with the agencies because they, they do such cutting edge stuff and are so central to national security that they're always capable of attracting very capable people. It's probably more across wider government where we need to look at where those resources are. What I, I would say is that, uh, particularly with front, Frontier AI, there is a really high degree of collaboration uh, with, the, with the tech companies involved and an openness and transparency about it and working together towards a, a common solution. And we're, we're very fortunate in this country to have a Demis at DeepMind, which, which forms part of Google, who's uh, really leading the charge in the UK and globally and is probably, without meaning to be sort of jingoistic about it, probably the world's leading authority on artificial intelligence. We're very, very fortunate to have him. Uh, and that, in turn, is helping to create a very strong culture in the UK through our, our universities. Um, and we've got, a very, we've got a strong ecosystem. The other observation I just make about AI generally, and I think, uh, uh, Didi, you're probably better <laughs> to, 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 to talk to this, but actually the funny thing about AI is uh, for a lot of its application, because it is it's meant to be intuitive and more human-like in the interface, a lot of it doesn't actually require the same level of technical skills in the application. The whole idea is that anyone can yes. uh, use we, it. We, so we, 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 we've, we spent a generation teaching our children to code, and now, now coding is going, dear AI, please write me some code that does <laughs> <Yes>. this. <laughs> in crude terms, of course you always need to code, but that, that, is, uh, that, is, that is certainly a, a, a part of it, the, the capacity of, of AI to do the, 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 the tech stuff itself. Yeah, and no, you know, I think it's it's a really important consideration, but I do think in the, in the UK we've seen with the you know establishment of the Frontier AI Task Force, you know, really quite quickly, and and a lot of kind of expert hires there, um, and again we've seen the regulators building up for quite some time expertise in this area too. So um, I think people aren't just motivated by you know they're motivated for kind of the the good and uh, and building trust in that and and. I think we are seeing a lot of collaboration between industry and government, which is encouraging. Uh, and, and Bruce, does that apply, and, and, and Nikki, does that apply beyond just, just AI to, to, to other risks in the, in the wake of the pandemic? Or Yes, yeah, so I think in, in answer to, to the question, it is about this collaboration. So if the brightest minds aren't in government, government needs to par partner with the brightest minds to get that information. And on the whole, it isn't industry versus government. Uh, the, 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 the benign participants in the market are very happy to collaborate on these issues. And we collaborate all the time with, with government. We have uh, often different objectives on, on, on issues. And one of the things we need to be better at in this country is breaking down some of the barriers that exist between public sector and private sector and the suspicion that one has of the other on, on a particular issue. But you know, if you look at something like Lloyd's, we are delivering these kinds of programs all the time, not specifically on AI, but on, on looking at analyzing data around a whole variety of risks that we underwrite in the marketplace. We're then looking at mitigation that goes on in terms of how our customers behave and, and then paying claims. That data is absolutely available to government to try to help them as they get their arms around these kinds of risks. And we're obviously not the only institution capable of doing those kinds of things. Yeah, I would agree, and I think that um, I think there's two points here. Really, the, the first is obviously making sure, and you know that, that um, as Dee said, the question implies that there is joint working where particularly there are new or emerging uh, threats. Um, I think uh, from my time in government, I think sometimes there is too much of a kind of not invented here, and there's a suspicion sometimes that um, you know, perhaps uh, companies, private sector, um, may have other agendas in terms of, of, of working, and I think that's that's a shame because I think that means that um, sometimes the, the best minds aren't invited in early enough until perhaps there is you know, a, a crisis. But equally, I think the point about um, regulators working together and agencies, um, in terms of the mitigations that perhaps the insurance sector will expect their, their customers to take, 
um, let's take cyber, actually the role of an agency like the National Cyber Security Centre is absolutely critical because the work that they do with um, businesses that are seeking insurance or, or even individuals, um, and I know with another hat on, actually the work that they're doing, particularly in relation to um, avoiding banking or making banking more resilient in terms of, of cyber, is absolutely vital. And that sharing of intelligence is critical because ultimately it serves nobody if a key sector goes down because of a cyber hack, whether it's um, you know, in the private sector or, 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 or a the French, public. Or a French airline entering its uh, data incorrectly. Uh, precisely, precisely. And allegedly, what was this, a one in 50,000 chance of that happening, but there it did, and it caused absolute uh, mayhem. Yeah, we, we had to cancel our family there at the CPS. We had a children's entertainer lined up, and half of our staff were trapped on holiday. There we are. <laughs> I bet uh, that wasn't the risk register. <laughs> should have been. <laughs> Safari P was... Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, um, okay, um, I have... Oh, well, um, um, if I could just ask about climate adaptation, um, which is, is perhaps somewhat unique in, in that it's a risk you can very much see coming yeah. and also can calculate the impact of um, quite readily, and yet, for example, last summer, the heat wave, 40 C temperatures in England, railway tracks buckling, heat, um, Luton Airport had to shut down for several hours because yeah. the runway was too hot. Um, it, it strikes me that in society, uh, we sort of internalized the um, mitigation bit of, of the climate story, but the adaptation bit, um, it, it still sort of gets us by surprise every time. Like, oh God, you know, none, none of the London Underground is air conditioned, ah, you know. And I, I suppose my question is, is, how do we move that conversation forward? I think I think the I think government has a role to play. I think regulators um, uh, absolutely have a, a role to play. And um, again, the the PRA, the arm of the, the Bank of England, Prudential Regulation and Financial Services, are now requiring um, a number of, of key financial service institutions to model uh, climate risk in, in the way that, that other types of risks are modelled. And that's no doubt that is changing uh, behaviour and the conversations uh, around uh, boardrooms. And I think we're only going to see uh, more of that. I think you, the point you make is, is, is well made because up until now, I think climate has been particularly often in the insurance sector with schemes like Floodery. People have talked about flooding. Um, and of course, actually heat is something that I think we're all going to have to think about you know, uh, much sooner uh, than perhaps might have been expected. I am not in any way any kind of expert climate modeler, but clearly what we saw from last summer and from other parts of you know, other incidents around the world is that the risks of extreme heat are both immediate uh, but also in terms of what that does in terms of population movement or the ability to do business or what it does to, to supply chains, for example, it's something I think that, that the private sector is going to have to confront much more quickly. Again, that is an opportunity for joint working because there may well be expertise within arms of the, of the public sector that is able to share in terms of helping uh, the insurance sector to, to price that risk and also to advise customers on how to mitigate. I, Bruce, before we came on, uh, we were, came on air, um, came on stage, we were talking about um, Florida and the. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, so I, I, Florida is quite a good example, actually, because in fact, the governor of Florida paid a visit to Lloyd's in May. Um, I think he was really campaigning uh, before the announcement of his presidency, candidacy for the presidency. But, but his ostensible reason for coming to Lloyd's was to ask for more natural catastrophe insurance covers. So, what we know in Florida is that the frequency of hurricanes is greater, and the severity of their impact, depending on the path they take is greater as well. But the key around this is not just providing insurance, it's about behavior change. So what's been happening in Florida over the last 40 or 50 years is there's been internal immigration into Florida from the rest of the United States. So typically people who've been moving to Florida are reasonably affluent. So they have expensive lives and expensive assets. Um, and then they all want to build properties on the coast. That is where the most expensive property is in Florida, as it is in most places in the world. And, and guess which uh, properties are most adversely affected by a, a hurricane coming on shore. And of course, the process of building more of these, um, these properties uh, uh, in Florida has been to concrete over the state. So when, when the hurricane hits, there's nowhere for the water to run off. And so the impact of a hurricane is that much greater. So, so we absolutely need to have behavioral change. And I think some of it is just about humans adapting. I'm not sure all of it's about regulation, I have to say. I think it's just common sense. Um, and uh, there's a, there's a, a, a great a, a town in, uh, in uh, Australia which has been flooded uh, three or four times in the last six years. It's in a floodplain. It's going to flood. I'm all, always quite keen on that uh, picture that emerges when we have floods in this country of uh, Tewkesbury Abbey. 
is always sitting up there on a hill and it's completely surrounded by houses that are completely flooded. And I sit there going, you know, I think these medieval people knew a thing or two <laughs> about where to build their properties. In the United States, they have something called the National Flood Insurance Program and you can make a claim um, for a maximum of $250,000 from the government if your property gets flooded. And that has increasingly become the first line of insurance in the United States. And then companies like Lloyd's provide insurance above that $250,000 uh, first loss. I met a man, I went to Houston in 2017 after there'd been a hurricane that went through it, and I met a man whose house had been flooded for the fifth time, third time in five years, and he claimed his $250,000 from the United States government three times in five years, and nobody was telling him to build his property somewhere else. So, so some of this is about common sense in terms of the adaptability of the way we've got to behave um, as the environment changes around us, as well, of course, as dealing with uh, global warming uh, as a direct challenge in its own right. We're out of time. I'm just going to sneak in one final question. One word answers only. What is the one thing that keeps you up at night and that you worry about the most? Uh, going, uh, from starting with Dee Dee and then going. Um, oh gosh. Well, I suppose it has to be AI. <laughs> uh, vulnerability to hacking. Yeah, cybercrime. Uh, as a politician, I always want to say two things. But <laughs> go. A go. A a AI and geopolitical instability. Okay. Well, uh, if the, if the, if <laughs> if, if we're all still here in a, in a year's time, we hope to, uh, <laughs> we hope to see you again. Um, thank you uh, very much for coming. Uh, thank you so much to um, Lloyds of London for supporting us, to our, our panel for coming. Um, up next in half an hour's time is a very topical panel, Will We Ever Cut Taxes Again, uh, chaired by our own uh, Tom Cockerty. And after that's our final event of the, uh, of the program from our colleagues at CapEx, Justice for the Young. So please come and join us for either of those, but also please thank our panel very, very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.